Okay, everyone. So um, let us just uh, do a few more questions, uh, and um, uh, are there any questions about what we have been doing just now before I go on to the written ones uh, about this last session? Huh? Anyone want to ask anything about that? Huh? Yeah, thank you. Oh, <laughs> okay. We're gonna gonna have to. Use. Everyone is okay. So let's just go into these questions then, because uh, then we can. Uh, One thing, okay, please. Uh, yeah. What is the form? Uh, well, the form it would usually be because the light usually has a shape to it. Yes, the light has a shape, like a sun or something like that. That's the form of the light. Yeah, so light and form go together, like a shape. Yeah, often like just the sun or the moon or some round, usually a round shape, uh, but it can be anything. That's usually what it means. Uh. But it can also be other things, like you know, the lady talking about today about all the seeing all these houses. Yeah, that's also a form, a shape. Yeah, but that's that's too co that's a bit too complex. You want to make it simple. So next time, sim make it simpler. Then it's going to be more, make it more powerful if it's simpler. Yeah, yeah. But just, still, you're doing very well. Yeah. So yeah. Ajahn, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what if it's just color? Color. Color is okay. Yeah, I, it, that's fine. Yeah. No form. No form, <laughs> just color. Yeah. Well, that's what he's talking about. There. You, you uh, ideally you want to get the bright, bright color together with a form. But uh, what if you have a, some light already? Good. Uh, keep on with that. If it feels I good, mean, uh, I mean the, the color. It's yeah. be beautiful, beautiful color. So that's yeah. a light, right? Good. Yeah. But the yeah. form must be with, with must it be with the light? Usually it, it comes with the light. Yeah. Okay. The, the light so it itself can be has a, a form. Uh, something yeah. in the light. It can be, no, it means the light itself has a shape, like oh. the sun, like the sun is round, right? Yeah. If, like you're seeing the sun, if you see the sun in your mind, you're seeing a round, like seeing a round shape. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry? Both, it, both is usually better because it's if you can focus on it. Yeah. You can use it as a, it becomes a focus point for your meditation practice. Yeah? It's something you can kind of stay with quite easily. Yeah. That's kind of the idea. Okay. So let's get on to the questions. We have so many questions here, so we're going to get started. Uh, dear Ajahn, yesterday conceit was mentioned uh, in the Fear and Dread Sutta. Sometimes I get feed feedback that I am proud or being a snob. <laughs> I am not having this awareness. How do I develop awareness in myself? Uh, what are the methods from the Dhamma that can help me overcome this bad quality? Uh, um, I, you know, the thing is that, remember, people perceive all kinds of things in us, right? They see us as snobbish or proud, you know, uh, and I have heard people saying all kinds of things about me. You can probably find every defilement in me if you want to. Uh, but um, the, the thing is that other people don't really know us that well. Uh, so if, if, if you feel that they may have a point, well, then look carefully at yourself and see if you have that sense of pride. You should be able to see it. Uh, but don't accept other people's judgment just because they have a judgment about you. Because other people don't know you. They don't know whether you are really proud or not. Uh, sometimes the way we come across is not how we actually are within uh, our psychological life. Uh, it may just be our mannerism that seems pr pride or arrogant or whatever. But actually, we may actually not be psychologically arrogant or proud. Uh, so, if someone says this to you but you can't see it, then don't worry about it. But then you can, you know, you can keep it at the back of your mind if you wish and you can maybe come back to this occasionally. And if you do see that maybe there is a degree of pride there, then when you see it, that's when you deal with it. But not, don't try to chase ghosts because uh, uh, that's, it's, not gonna, it's never going to work out too much. So uh, find that middle way where you listen to others but you don't listen too much so as to kind of uh, uh, yeah. All right. Okay, next one. Dear Ajahn, do we have exhaust? Do we have to exhaust all kammas before parinibbana? That sounds like an impossibility. What does Sutta say about this matter? Thank you very much. You do not have to exhaust all kammas. This is a Jain practice. 
and there is one sutta that uh, mentions the idea of exhausting all kama, but it seems to be a Jain insertion into the suttas. Uh, and this uh, was a study done by a monk called Venerable Analayo, who has done a lot of studies about the suttas, uh, and that was his conclusion that this particular sutta was not really a pr proper Buddhist teachings. Uh, this is what you find in certain schools of Buddhism, certain ways of teaching meditation, they actually do teach that you're supposed to exhaust all kamma. Uh, you know, if you have pain in meditation, that's just your kamma being exhausted, but actually it is not really a Buddhist teaching. So. And sometimes you go to Buddhist retreats and you get non-Buddhist teachings, so. which is unfortunate, right? But actually it does happen. Uh, and, uh, and that is often because uh, those teachers, uh, some, some teachers haven't actually studied all that much. Uh, and they don't really know what the suttas contain. They haven't really properly done their homework. And that can be very problematic sometimes. So, so uh, no, it is impossible. You overcome that kamma through insight. And when you have insight, that kamma no longer has the ability to bear fruit. And for that reason, you don't have to exhaust all the kamma. Dear Ajahn, this is the first time I'm attending this kind of sutta study retreat. I am so inspired by your approach to the suttas. It opens my mind to the Buddha's teaching even further. I am very happy to hear that. So uh, thank you for this, uh, for this nice thing. I, my purpose is always to try to open people's minds to the suttas. That's wonderful. Your directing us to look at the Buddha from a humanity angle is so refreshing that uh, in a strange way, I'm more in awe of the Lord Buddha instead of diluting my reverence and fascination for him. I find the effect amazing. Again, I'm very happy to hear that as well, because I actually agree with that, uh, because then we can actually relate to the Buddha in a real way, rather than thinking of the Buddha as something unattainable and weird, uh, and you have no real kind of connection with the Buddha. However, the truth is that the fascination is still not enough to dislodge the inner fear over this thing called renunciation. I wonder what extra qualities uh, that you have uh, that I don't have in me that makes you renounce. Is it more a push factor or a pull factor? Sukihoto Ajahn, you have mentioned past kamba. Um, you are already renouncing because you are here. Coming here is already renunciation. Uh, becoming a monk is just one step in that renunciation process. Uh, and uh, it's not kind of any different from coming here. You already have taken one step. Then when you decide to keep the five precepts all the time, maybe you probably do that already. That's another act of renunciation. Uh, when you decide to live the life according to the Noble Eightfold Path, that's another step of renunciation. You are already renouncing, even if you don't understand uh, that you're doing it. Uh, so you're already on that track. yeah. Becoming a monk or nun is just another step in that particular direction. The reason why it can look scary to become a monk and nun is because it seems like an irreversible step. Yeah, you now you still have a degree of control of your life. But once you become a monk and nun, okay, it's a bit more shaky. Do is it reversible or not? Actually, it is reversible, but of course, it is not. It is not always easy because you may have you know left certain things behind. It makes it more difficult. So what I would recommend you to do, come to some meditation retreats where you do more intensive meditation. This kind of retreat, we do a little bit of meditation, but it's mostly learning about the Buddha's teachings. Uh, come on a more intensive meditation retreat where you meditate several hours a day. Uh, come and stay in the monastery for a while. Uh, if you want to become an anagarika, anagarika, easy to reverse, right? Uh, very easy to reverse. So you become a person in white, uh, Pakao, Anagarika Pakao, they call it in Thailand. Uh, you do it for a while and you check it out. And you can take baby steps. Uh, so you never take a step that you feel is irreversible. It becomes very hard for you. Huh? But you are already on the path of renunciation, whether you know it or not. Uh, yeah. So it is not becoming a monk or nun. Uh, it's not such a big deal as you might think it is. Uh. Monks and nuns are ordinary people too. Huh? <laughs> that is the reality. All right. Dear Ajahn, uh, there were numerous examples of lay anagamas in the suttas, namely Chitta, the householder, Hattaka, Alaki, and Vel Velukantika, Nandamata. Where these accomplishments, things from the past, is it possible to aspire to be like them in this day and age? Uh, 
it is possible to aspire to be like that, uh, but uh, it is not. I, I don't know many lay anagamis, I'm putting it that way here. <laughs> it is not kind of uh, easy, yeah, it is not obvious uh, that uh, it. You know, the point of the monastic path is that the monastic path is really the highway to Nibbana. So if you want to become a stream enter, non returner, anagami, or arahant, uh, I would really recommend the monastic path if you are serious about it. It's difficult enough to become these things as a monastic, let alone as a lay person. There are many, many benefits of monastic life. It may be difficult to see that as a lay person, but one of the great benefits is that you are immersed in the Dhamma. The Dhamma is around you all the time. Yeah, You always have that input. As a lay person, you have to do all the worldly things that distract you from the path. You have to deal with difficult people, all of these kind of things. It makes it more difficult as a lay person, all the distractions that you have. As a monastic, you often have very good situation. You know, the situation that I have in our monastery in Perth. I have a little kuti in the forest, completely by myself. Yeah, Perfect situation for meditation practice and everything else. And you are secluded from the world taken away from the distractions of all the sensory things in the world, uh, staying by yourself. Uh, I have a wonderful teacher in Ajahn Brahm uh, who is there to inspire me. Uh, when I listen to Ajahn Brahm sometimes I just sit listening to Ajahn Brahm and the talks that he gives in the monastery are actually quite different from the talks you hear that he normally gives to lay people. Uh, they're often profound, they are deep. Uh, there's a feeling of deep feeling of peace and uh, contentment and satisfaction and kindness and all these good qualities just by sitting in the presence of someone like that. Uh, and it's incredibly useful to have a teacher who has all of these Dhamma qualities. Uh. So as a monastic you have a lot of advantages. Uh. And so I would say if you are serious about this, uh, I would say please consider the monastic life uh, because it is very powerful. Can you aspire to be an anagami? Just is, I would say just aspire to be kind, yeah? That's what you should be aspire to. And then anagami will happen if you are really, really kind. <laughs> All right. Too old already? Too, no, nev there's no such thing as too old. You're, if you're not dead, you're all right, uh, yeah? <laughs> if you're dead, okay, then maybe a little bit too late. So <laughs> Was that your question, Jennifer? No, it wasn't your question. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Okay, good. So um, there's no such thing as too old. Yeah, this is the this is the fear factor coming in. The kind of that's the excuse the excuse factor coming in there. <laughs> too what? Too dead to practice. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> well that that is a different one. So then it, there's um, you're not dead because you got reborn, right? So you're still there. Uh, you're st you're st you're st still around. Uh. <laughs> okay. Next one. Ajahn Sukihotu. Can I just clarify about the southern transmission and northern transmission, as most of the Theravada teachings are from the southern transmission here? All right, so um, um, so B B Buddhism is um, kind of divided into, you know, the way that Buddhism is uh, divided is that it's divided into, initially, Buddhism spread out in India. Huh? And as it spread out in India, it went to obviously different geographical locations. So you had the Theravadans who went all the way to the south of India, and then you have some of the other schools like the Sarvastivadans, they would go to the north, to what is now Kashmir and Gandhara in the north, Pakistan, Afghanistan, those areas. We had the Dharmaguptaka school that also went into the Gandharan area, and then you have the Mahasangikas that stayed more in central India around the, uh, the Ganges plain and that kind of thing. And then there are also other schools, the Mula Sarvastivans and other schools as well. And all those various schools, they spread out over India. And once you have a geographical dispersion, and this happened around the time of Ashoka, then because of that dispersion, they started to develop slightly differently. And because they developed differently, even though the suttas were essentially the same, the commentaries would be different, the Abhidhamma was different, and they kind of move in different, with different ideas. The Sarvastivadans had the famous idea of all exist, Sarva Astivada, Sarva all, Asti is, uh, Vada is doctrine, doctrine that all exists. And so you had this spreading of Buddhism, that's the beginning of what we call sectarianism. 
the various sects, if you like, within Buddhism started to uh, appear. You had the Pugalavada, which is the idea of the doctrine of the existence of a person apart from the impermanent five khandhas, which is a stra strange kind of doctrine. Uh, and then these various schools, they started to spread out even more. And the schools in the north of India, the monastics there, they would move on to the Silk Road. Yeah, the Silk Road is just north of the India in Central Asia. And the Silk Road is a famous trade that went all the way from Europe all the way to China, all the way to Xi'an and Luoyang and those ancient capitals of China. And so these monastics, they would get onto the Silk Road and then they would travel on the Silk Road with traders and they would go to China. And when they got to China, they would translate the Indian text into Chinese. And this is how the early suttas were transmitted into China. So this is um, kind of the beginning, if you like, of the northern school of Buddhism, how it developed. But what is interesting about China is that uh, in China, the early suttas never really got a foothold. In China, it was later ideas in Buddhism that became stronger. And that is why in China you had the Bodhisattva ideal, the Mahayana school, the Yogacara ideas, the Madhyamaka school. These are later developments in Buddhism that then got a foothold in Chinese Buddhism. And that's why you have things like Kuan Yin. Yeah? Kuan Yin comes from Avalokiteshvara, who is one of the Bodhisattvas, uh, part of the Mahayana tradition, that then becomes Kuan Yin down the track. And that becomes then the northern school of, uh, of um, Buddhism. is one way of, ter of uh, using the terminology, calling it the northern school of Buddhism. So this is how we kind of see different developments. And because Buddhism came later to China, and because Buddhism was already transformed in India at that time, it was more natural for them to take on board these later ideas that then was Mahayana ideas, and especially the Bodhisattva ideal, and that became very prominent in China as a consequence. So this is kind of a very rough sketch of the development of Buddhism. And even later, Buddhism went to Tibet, and because it went very late to Tibet, the Buddhism in India had developed even further, and that's why you have the idea of Vajrayana and Tantra, the tantric practices that came in there, were supposed to speed up the practice even further, when in fact probably they are a corruption of the Dhamma. To, not, maybe not all of them, but many of them are a corruption of the, of the Dhamma, to be perfectly honest. Especially the things that you hear about, sometimes you really wonder what they were doing here. And uh, although I must say that there are Tibetan Buddhists who also practice in a very conservative and right way, so it's very dangerous to be too, too kind of uh, reductive about these things. So, so uh, that is the difference. And for all of these reasons, because all the various schools have developed, and it's very important to remember that even Theravada Buddhism has developed, right? Uh, Theravada Buddhism started off with the suttas, then you have the commentaries, then you have the Visuddhimagga, then you have the Abhidhamma, uh, so all, and then you have the expansion of the Kuddha Nikaya. All of these things are what we now call Theravada. If you ask me, am I Theravada? To be honest with you, probably not, yeah, because I'm not interested in the Abhidhamma. And if you're not interested in the Abhidhamma, you are the black sheep of Theravada. Right? So I'm the black sheep, or the brown sheep, or whatever you want to call me, but I'm a dodgy character. So am I Theravada? Probably not. I'm more like trying to follow the Buddha. I'm trying to be a disciple of the Buddha. That's what I'm really trying. So all schools in Buddhism, Theravada inclusive, has, has developed beyond the early suttas. And that is why, to me, it is so interesting to try to go back to the word of the Buddha, because the Buddha is a teacher. Without the Buddha, all the rest of Buddhism is actually completely meaningless. It is only because of the word of the Buddha that everything else has a meaning. So what the Buddha said is the pillar, the foundation of everything else. And that is why it is so important to go back to the word of the Buddha. This is a rough idea of how these things are. So we don't really have to call ourselves anything except disciples of the Buddha. It was interesting because I was recently in the United States. I was a whole month in the U.S. traveling over the country teaching. And I noticed how many of the places now call themselves early Buddhist, uh, early, early Buddhist places, early Buddhist centers, right? There's a very catching on around the world, becoming a very important part of how people define themselves. And in a way, we can unify around the idea of early Buddhism. 
uh, the very famous, um, uh, 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 he was a, a monk in Taiwan, uh, Master Yinshen. Yeah, very famous monk. He started out in China, and then he, when we had the uh, uh, revolution in China, he went to Taiwan. And he, uh, probably the most important, significant uh, monastic in Taiwan, he was like the uh, inspiration be behind the Fog Wan Shan, be be behind the Dharma Drum Mountain, behind the, uh, uh, what's it called, the uh, Su Chi Foundation, all of that. Yeah, very, very influential monk. Uh, and he also made the point that actually the Buddha's word are found in the Nikayas or the Agamas. Yeah? He realized that the Mahayana tradition is a later development. So these are even the very most famous of the Mahayana practitioners uh, agree where the word of the Buddha is to be found, which is kind of interesting. Yeah? Okay, number two, an observation. Is the Theravada tradition too focused on inner peace that if it lacks involvement in helping people during disasters. Uh, doesn't, helping peop doesn't helping people improve the kindness and compassion in practice? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we tend to lose out to the Christians from this aspect in helping others. Uh, yeah, no, I, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, uh, we should not just be passively kind, we should be actively kind. Uh, and passive kindness, is that really kindness at all? Sometimes you wonder. Uh, so we should actively be kind, we should be involved, uh, but we should not be too involved. Uh, we should find the balance between involvement, uh, we should make sure that we look after our own happiness and our own uh, inner resources uh, so as to enable us to be effective in the world. Uh, the life of the Buddha is actually a very good example. Uh, the Buddha retired from the world for a large number of years to develop his inner qualities, uh, and when he was ready then he returned to the world again to uh, help the world out. Uh, and we should also find that balance yeah, between helping and looking after ourselves. Then we have the right balance. We should not try to emulate the Christians. Because for the Christians, everything is service. For us, there's a different kind of approach. But yes, I think you are right. We should look, learn a little bit from the Christians. Okay. Ajahn, may you be well and happy. Well, that's very kind. I, I agree with that one. Uh, may I be well and happy? <laughs> so, may you be well and happy too. It's very it's wonderful to have you here. Wow, I experienced going into deep stillness, enjoying all the metta from all the participants with a snap finger, warm and delightful, even just lost a sec, even just last a second. Sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much. Never experienced before. And is Great! I'm so happy up to hear that, that you go into it at deep stillness, uh, even for a short time, and having met of all the participants. Uh, well done. It is very, uh, very, very glad that you have these kind of experiences. Uh, and once you have these experiences, they will help you to guide you in the future. Because now you know more about what is available on the Buddhist path. And when you know that, it will be inspiring for you to continue your practice. Uh, so well done. Uh, and thank you. Please keep... Uh, uh, these little messages are very nice messages to hear people having good results. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, good evening, Ajahn. My question is related to rebirth. Uh, we all will die somehow, someday. When we die, the only thing that remains will be our mind or consciousness. Uh, how long do we remain in that state after we pass on? Ten minutes, one hour, or days later? How does the process work? Can Ajahn enlighten us on this? Uh, so. The process, how it seems to work, yeah, by putting together the various pieces in the suttas, uh, uh, it will vary a bit depending on the person. If you have very strong kamma, you might get reborn straight away, like you go into a jhana state. Uh, uh, but for many people, what will happen is that you will uh, uh, kind of leave your body, and then you will have another body. Yeah, you will still feel like you. Oh, this is me now. Okay, now I look like this. I'm this, you know, roughly the same as before but you're no longer attached to the coarse body, like a near-death experience. Uh, yeah? And then you uh, stay there for a while. Yeah, this is called the antrabhava, like the intermediate existence. Uh, and then at some point you have uh, maybe a life review, and uh, you kind of have a judgment of your own conduct. Uh, and that judgment of your own conduct will then propel you into the future, depending on how you judge yourself. Uh, something like that is what happens. Yeah. So consciousness, it doesn't feel like you are just consciousness, it feels like you are there, yeah? Because that consciousness will have 
all the ordinary experiences with you, you will still have a body. It is more subtle than your ordinary coarse body as a human, but it's still as if you have a body in a sense, a more refined kind of body in that state. So it's not as different as you think it is. Still you, oh, here I am. Yeah, it's not kind of, it's not weird. It's just you being there. Yeah. So even like Deva Loka, you get reborn in the heavenly realm. It's like, oops, now I have a Deva, Deva body. Yeah, okay. So we carry on having a Deva body. It's not, it sounds very strange, but when it happens, I think it feels very, very ordinary to you. Yeah. Sukihoto Ajahn, I would like to share an experience that you have mentioned this morning. Yeah. Recently, I've received a Dhammapada book from a friend, and I've been reading it at night when I couldn't sleep. Okay, that's wonderful. After reading a few verses, I can really sleep well. And there was one time I dreamt of the characters in the book coming alive. <laughs> okay, is that what you meant by Dhamma dream? That's great. So, what you mean, Dhammapada book, is you, what you mean there is the Dhammapada Atakata. There is the Dhammapada, is just the verse. And then there's the story around the verse. That is called the Dhammapada Atakata, the commentary. That is probably what you mean there. Is that what you mean by Dhamma Dream? Yeah, sounds pretty good. Yeah, it sounds like basically that's what you, you had. So uh, that's really cool. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about this morning. So uh, great. So I hope that was a happy dream. And if it wasn't happy, then it probably was not a real Dhamma Dream. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, I would like your advice on how to get rid of a minor grudge. I was in this group involved in an activity. We have a WhatsApp group for communication. One day the admin of this group had a private banter with another person talking about doing what, what in the spare time and going where on holiday. Uh, I WhatsApp a message reminding that this WhatsApp chat group should confine to the activity and not private messages. Uh, the private banter stopped for a while, then it resumed again. Again, I sent a reminder not to have private messaging in the group. Uh, must be because of my action, the advice, the admin removed me from this chat group. <laughs> okay. Actually, I couldn't be bothered with the removal, and I do not mind. But then I developed a grudge against the admin. <laughs> I still see her, I just act superficially friendly. <laughs> I do not hate her, but cannot bring myself to like her, nor glad to see her. In fact, I don't like to meet her. I would avoid her if I can. I know that this feeling is unhealthy. How do I eliminate this feeling? It is not hatred, it is dislike. <laughs> So, uh, you just have to remind, remember that she is just a person. Yeah, she's just like all people. She probably doesn't really, not worried about you. She just had this idea that uh, uh, you were, maybe she didn't like what you were saying in the group. Maybe she had a different idea on how the group is run. Remember, we always perceive the world in different ways. Uh, your way of perceiving the world, her way of perceiving the world, clashing with each other. Uh, and it's actually completely impersonal. It's not about you at all. Uh, and the reason you have a grudge is because you feel that it is about you. Uh, yeah, she is treating you the wrong way. Actually, she probably doesn't have no. She probably is perfectly okay with you. It's just your feeling is in there. Uh. So remember that she is like a robot. She's just doing her thing. Uh, yeah, she doesn't know what she's doing, just like everyone else in the world. Uh. It doesn't really concern you anyway. Uh. So uh, just. Uh, Shrug your shoulders and carry on. Next time you see her, give her a hug yeah? <laughs> and see what happens. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah I, I must admit I'm feeling a little bit tired now. I can't really come up with any kind of profound solutions at the moment for these kind of things. It just becomes a bit superficial. But uh, the, um, yeah, anyway, good luck. <laughs> Okay, a couple of more questions to finish off. Um, dear Ajahn, thank you very much for your insightful sharing. I have an immense joy to attend your Sutta retreats and to follow your guided death contemplation. My question relates to my meditation. One, occasionally I can relax most parts of my body, 
but there is a lump in my heart that is very constricting. Please guide me on how to relax and dissolve this constricted feeling in my chest area. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you, what you can do is uh, focus on that particular feeling, uh, stay with that particular feeling, uh, and sometimes when you focus in on these feelings, uh, they start to change because of your focus. Uh, yeah, so focus on it, uh, bring a sense of compassion and kindness to the focus, uh, and then see what happens as you focus on that particular feeling, and see if it dissolves or changes in any way as you do that. Uh, yeah, this can sometimes work, because particularly if you bring a good and kind attitude to it. Uh, this is one way. The opposite way is to ignore it. Uh, yeah, this is the opposite. Ignore that feeling entirely and just carry on with your meditation instead uh, and develop maybe a sense of general metta, a sense of general peace and calm through the breath meditation, through just relaxing uh, and then see by avoiding and not worrying about the feeling, yeah, by just letting it be, uh, see if over time actually it dissolves by focusing on other things instead. Uh. If you find it hard to do your meditation alone, sometimes it can be useful to use a guided meditation, someone whose voice you like to listen to, Ajahn Brahm, whoever it is, a voice where you feel that you get into the mood of meditation. One of the difficulties of meditating by yourself is finding the right attitude, the right mood that makes the meditation work. Hearing the voice of someone who has a nice meditation voice, who has the right qualities, can help you to get into the right mood. As you listen to that, you relax more, you just sit back, you wait for the meditation to happen, and as you do that, inclining your mind very gently towards metta, towards gratitude, towards remembering some good actions, things calm down, and suddenly one day you find that the hardness or the constriction inside, suddenly it's gone. Yeah, it's weird. Sometimes by being obsessed with the, with the constriction, it makes it worse. By letting go of the obsession, just letting it be and focusing on something else, suddenly it just disappears by itself. So try either of these two methods and see what happens. When the breath becomes hardly discernible and the nimitta appears, wow, okay, this is really cool. How do I deepen my meditation from this point? <coughs> <coughs> Thanks very much, Adan. So, if you have a nimitta appearing, yeah, so the first of all is to make sure that it really is a real nimitta, yeah, a real sign. Yeah. And the way you know that, it must be very blissful. Yeah. When the nimitta appears, you should be experiencing joy and happiness, yeah. usually quite strong joy and happiness. It should also be very peaceful, it should be really delightful. If those feelings are there, then you know it is the real deal. Yeah? Sometimes people have very visual minds, they see nimittas even though it is not the real samadhi, because the visual aspect of the mind creates these shapes for them. So you have to make sure it's the real thing. And this is why the Buddha in the suttas, he focuses on the feelings rather than what you see. It is the feelings that make ensure that it's the real deal that you have. So if it is a real beautiful nimitta with powerful, beautiful feelings coming with it, stay with the nimitta. Yeah? Just be passive, enjoy the experience of that nimitta, the light and the mind and the feelings. Put your attention in the middle of the nimitta yeah? and allow it to expand, allow it to become more profound, allow it to become more peaceful, even more happy, just by being passive. At this point in meditation, being passive is the most important thing. Yeah? Allow it, then gradually it become more peaceful, more happy, and eventually, if you carry on like that, you will enter a very deep state of samadhi eventually. So this is what is going on. And this is the ideal thing. And I'm very glad that you're getting some beautiful results in a meditation practice. Okay. Sukihoto Ajahn, thank you for your kindness and endless patience in teaching us. We appreciate you very much, Ajahn, okay? Very happy to be appreciated. Uh, I appreciate you too, because it's good to have good company and being able to practice these teachings together. 
Number one, per my understanding, Devadatta had accessed the jhanas to the extent of developing psychic powers. I find it hard to believe that he was not even a sotapanna, as he did not have a right view. Is it possible for someone with jhanas not to develop the knowledges and insight necessary to become sotapanna? Yes, it is possible, especially the early jhanas, like the first and second. You can develop those, and you may not necessarily have uh, the insights uh, of the path at the same time. So it can happen, and it seemed to have happened with uh, Devadatta, for instance. Number two, Ajahn, you said that the mind would slowly detach from the body upon death. Uh, roughly how many hours would that be? <laughs> Sometimes it happens very fast, right? Sometimes you have an accident and the mind is, boom, gone like that. It happens in the fraction of a second, happens immediately. So it really depends on the, the circumstances, how these things happen. Huh? Um, so you can't really say. Huh? Is the mind affected by the condition of the body? For example, if the organs were being cut out for the organs donations before the body has properly died. Huh? Um, I, it, this is a difficult question. I'm, I'm not really sure what the answer is to, to that question. I, uh, I think a lot of the time when you die, the mind will al already leave the body, so you will already be gone, and then if someone takes the organs, you, maybe you are very happy, you think, please take the organs, yeah, wonderful, and maybe you rejoice, yeah, you're sitting there, you're rejoicing that this is like your laugh, last gift to humanity before you get reborn, right? So maybe that can make you very, very happy. Yeah? Are there circumstances where you are clinging on to the body, you are considered dead, uh, but uh, everyone else thinks you're dead, but you're actually still there? Can that happen? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. But uh, I would say that if you are a good person uh, and you have lived well, uh, then the likelihood of there being a problem is very small, because most likely you will release from the body and you will rejoice maybe in that last act of generosity. That would be my guess, uh, even though I it's very hard to be 100% sure about these things uh, because probably it varies enormously from person to person. Uh. So, but it is uh, a little bit of an unknown, I have to admit that, and more research is probably required on that one. Uh. Then, then it's too late to come back, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no more coming back anymore, yeah, that's, that's it, uh, you've had it. <laughs> Yeah, and you probably don't want to come back if you're missing the heart. You know, it's kind of a, it's not, it's not the same. <laughs> okay, last question for today, everyone. This is perfect timing. I understand that the last thought just prior to passing away is very important. So, what is the best way of thinking prior to passing him? All right. So, so this is a very common understanding in Theravada Buddhism. But because I am not a Theravada monk. <laughs> I'm going to give you a different answer. Yeah. So, uh, I think this whole idea of focusing on the last thought moment is very unfortunate. Uh, because there you are on your deathbed, uh, it's difficult enough to die as it is already, uh, and then you have to think of the last thought moment. Imagine the stress, yeah? No, the last thought is so important. Think the right, think the right thing. I'm dying! <laughs> okay. And it's kind of a, it's, to me, it's kind of the crazy idea. You're on a deathbed. You just want to relax, right? You want to enjoy the process of dying. You don't want to be stressed out by thinking the last thought moment. And I think this whole idea of the last thought moment occurring, it comes from the Abhidhamma ideas of Theravada Buddhism. And the Abhidhamma idea is that from the last thought moment, it's called the Chutta Chitta, literally means the passing away mind. The next one is the Patisandhi Vinyana, the reconnecting consciousness, and there's nothing in between. There's no intermediate state. And so because one, the last thought moment, connects directly with the next life, then obviously it is important. But if that idea is wrong, which I think it is, then actually there is no problem. If you look at the suttas, rather than the commentaries, rather than the, the orthodox Theravada, there seems to be an intermediate state. And that intermediate state that is where you kind of, uh, the karma ripens, when you have the life review and everything kind of gets sorted out, then you get reborn afterwards. Uh. 
So I say, relax on your deathbed. Don't worry about your last thought moment, yeah? Just enjoy the process. That is the best way to actually go to a happy destination afterwards. Uh, and all of this last thought moment business is way overdone in Theravada Buddhism. And uh, I wish we didn't kind of buy into that so much, uh, because I think sometimes it can have detrimental effects on the deathbed if we do that. Short answer to a uh, something that actually is quite interesting, uh, but we will leave it at that. Uh, so I wish you all a very good night, uh, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow morning. In the meantime, let's just pay homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha.